Hare Krishna, happy Janmashtami to everyone. Um, today is the appearance day of Lord Krishna, August 23rd, 2019, planet Earth. So, um, because I'm now working actually full time on the Mahabharata, having completed a novel, uh, I would like to talk about the historical context of Lord Krishna's appearance. Um, because there is a historical context. Actually, the Mahabharata itself says that in um, the different sages begin the story at different points because in a sense, if we talk about Krishna's appearance, uh, and what led up to it, the whole cosmic creation leads up to it. So you can keep going back and back, farther and farther, more generations and all, and, 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 and so on. But there is a specific, more specific story, a history, which is how the Supreme Lord came to this world. And that more precise history, uh, the narration can begin at different points. The Mahabharata itself says that many sages begin with the story of Uparichara Vasu, King Vasu, who actually became emperor of the world. So um, King Vasu appeared four generations before Krishna, in the sense that Krishna's father is Vasudeva, his mother is Devaki in his pastimes. Uh, then you have the generation before them, Devaka is the father of Devaki, and of course, Ashura Sena is the father of Vasudeva. And on the, they correspond to the generation of uh, Pandu. And I, I'm sorry, Krishna's parents, Devaki and Vasudev, correspond to the generation of uh, Pandu, of Kangsa, uh, Vasudev's brother Kunti, so all those people are, so that's going back one generation from Krishna and two generations from Krishna, their parents, in the case of Pandu, his uh, biological father, of course, is Vyasdev, but his legal father by Dharma was um, Vichitravirya. And so he, uh, Pandu, Dhritarastra, and Vidura were actually born posthumously. So you have one generation before Krishna, which is everybody's parents, the Pandavas and Krishna and their parents, then uh, Krishna's grandparents, you could say that generation, that's going back to, and so that would go back to Vichitravirya in the case of Krishna, in the case of the Pandavas, of course, their legal father was Pandu, and his father was uh, Vichitravirya. Uh, and then, uh, if you go back before that, then, then the third generation back is Shantanu, King Shantanu, whose uh, daughter Satyavati was the father, was the mother of Vyasdeva and so on. So anyway, without going into all the details, it's a lot to remember at one time, but uh, Krishna, if you take Krishna and the Pandavas as one earthly generation, there are four previous generations. And so going back four generations, you come to King Vasu, who had two grandsons. One grandson was Vyasdeva, another grandson was Jarasandha, the demon. And so it's interesting, Vyas and Jarasandha are actually cousins. But in any case, uh, I'll briefly tell the history. In, in general terms, we always hear that there's sort of a perpetual battle between suras and asuras, between the godly and the ungodly in the universe as well as on earth. And that's true, of course. However, uh, approximately 5,000 years ago, and earlier, a little earlier than that, um, there was really an epic battle that kept going on and on between the Asuras and the Suras. And that, at least in our literature, is sort of the greatest battle. For example, if you study Western history, there was World War One and World War Two, and uh, although there have been many, many wars, those wars are particularly prominent. And, and if you know the real history, 
uh, there was really, in a sense, one war with a uh, halftime program. It's just like in soccer, right? You play one half, then you stop, and then there's the second half. So World War One and Two were really just two halves of the same game. But in any case, so those wars are very prominent, those world wars. So there were these uh, cosmic battles between the demons and the demigods and of course Krishna defending Dharma and justice and the devas and that battle actually begins this particular series of battles which culminates in the appearance of Krishna the reason I'm mentioning this is because when Krishna finally appears it's at the end of centuries of warfare and Krishna comes to finally end it so Krishna although he spoke Bhagavad Gita on the battlefield, and some people identify him in that way. But actually, Krishna ended centuries of warfare. And so I'm going to tell that story. Um, it begins in the eighth canto of the Bhagavatam, actually, where uh, in a scene where the, de the suras and the asuras, the devas and the asuras, are churning the ocean of milk to produce nectar and lots of other things. It was kind of all kinds of amazing things came out of that churning. What's interesting about this churning is that the ocean of milk is that Krishna appeared in those activities in two different avatars. First of all, he appeared as Lord Tortoise, only Krishna, right? Who else could think of an incarnation as a tortoise? Krishna came as Lord Tortoise and Mount Mandara, Mandarachala was put on his back, and it uh, and so then the Vasuki became like the churning rope, and then they they churned the ocean of milk. So then, once the nectar came out, once the nectar came out, uh, the devas wanted it, the suras, the asuras wanted it, and uh, the asuras somehow grabbed it. So then Krishna came again his second avatar in the same pastime as Mohini Murti and charmed, you know, it's like he said to the Asuras, hey, big boys, you know, he just, he charmed them and got the nectar and gave it to the gods. Now, the problem didn't end there because the Asuras, the, the demonic, clearly were not happy with this result. They felt they'd been cheated and so they were going to go to war over this, and they did. And that, so that battle, of course, all this is described in the eighth canto of the Bhagavatam, and when the battle between the uh, devas and the asuras, asuras and asuras, and that takes place, Krishna comes a third time. So there's actually three avatars, three incarnations of Krishna, related to the same sequence of events. The uh, it's sort of a typical scene, the devas, the demigods and the asuras are fighting and by sort of by conventional warfare, the devas doing well, then the asuras resort to sort of their, uh, what would you call it, uh, black ops. You know, they uh, sort of their, uh, they cheat all these magical weapons that you're not supposed to use in a battle because the battle is supposed to be a test of strength and bravery and military skill, not just a test of magic. But they bring out these magic weapons and, uh, and they start to defeat the, the demigods. Actually, uh, this battle is referred to in the 10th canto uh, just around the time of Krishna's birth. Because if you remember, when the eighth son of Devaki is born, uh, was Krishna. Krishna appears with his parents, and he reveals, he actually first is born and manifests as the four-handed Narayan. He tells his parents that I've done this because, just so you know, it's really me. Because if I just came as a little boy, you might think that this is not God. So, you know, like, here's my... Uh, what do they call it? Photo ID. You know, he came and he, as forehand in Orion, now you know who I really am. 
And of course, it changed back into Krishna. So, but then, as we know, Vasudev took Krishna across the Jamuna River, which parted. He took him to Gokula, where the uh, Krishna's famous devotees were living. He placed uh, Krishna in uh, on the Jasoda was sleeping. He placed Krishna on the, as you could say, on the lap or in the bed with Jasoda, and then Jasoda had actually given birth to Yoga Maya. So Vasudev took Yoga Maya, brought her back to Mathura and placed Yogamaya in the prison cell with Vasudeva and Devaki. So when Kangsa heard that a, a child was born Devaki, he rushed there and found a girl. And so he thought, what about these prophecies? You can't trust anyone. You can't even trust celestial prophecies anymore. But still, and then there's a very uh, piteous scene where Devaki begs for the life of her daughter and she tells her wicked cousin brother, that you killed all my children. Just let me keep this one daughter. And of course, Kong sits, uh, it's so cruel. He's on his knees because I guess he's he bent down. I mean, there wasn't much furniture in Devaki and Vasudev's cell, prison cell. So he's on his knees to see the baby and he grabs this little infant girl, just, just born girl. He grabs her by her two little legs, which are just tiny. He's going to actually smash her against the stone floor of the prison, which is, you know, it's awful. But that baby girl slips out of his hand, goes up into the sky and manifests as the terrifying Durga or Kali, the goddess, who tells Krishna, uh, Kansa, Manda, you fool, the... Uh, the child who will kill you is already born, but is somewhere else. And so uh, Kangsa is stunned and just bewildered. And maybe the only time in his life becomes a little humble. He apologizes to Vasudeva and Devaki. He begs forgiveness for all for killing their children. And he uh, even after all this, he asked their permission to leave. And um, he's humbled by it. However, his ministers say, what are you doing? You know, they kind of remind him, uh, yeah, this is crazy. We have to fight back. And then, and this is the point I wanted to make about the eighth canto. And then the ministers remind Kamsa that in your past life as Kalanemi in this great battle that took place in the eighth canto, in your past life, the demigods were all afraid of you. The devas, just by the sound of your bowstring, and they were begging you to spare their lives. And so these devas are nothing compared to you. So why do you fear them? And Krishna is just some deva. You'll defeat him just as you defeat all the other ones. So they remind Kangsa how he was overwhelming the devas, how he was um, just smashing them. And so that's Kangsa, that's Kalanemi. So this is going back to this battle when, when uh, Kangsa learns that in your in a past life, Krishna killed you. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about that battle in the Eighth Canto. And of course, what happens in that battle is Kalanemi, who's the, sort of the great warrior on the Asura side, when Vishnu comes riding on Garuda because Indra can't handle it, uh, Kalanemi, what's interesting, if you look at the Sanskrit verses, the eighth canto, uh, when Vishnu comes, he doesn't actually attack the Asuras. In other words, he might be a peacemaker. He doesn't attack the Asuras, and uh, he just shows up there on the back of Garuda, and no one really knows what he's going to do or what he's going to say. But Kalanemi, without waiting to find out, just attacks Vishnu. He, he actually throws a trident uh, at at Garuda, first kill Garuda. And um, Vishnu just grabs it. You know, it's going it's going very high speed. He just grabs it in midair. And with, with that same trident, he throws it back at Kalanemi. 
And Vishnu throws it so hard, it actually goes all the way through the body of Kalanemi, who's riding on a lion. Kalanemi's riding on a lion. And uh, it goes through Kalanemi, it goes all the way through the lion, the celestial lion, and it just goes into the earth. And of course, they're dead. Kalanemi and the lion are dead. So that's in the eighth canto, and that's what Kangsa is reminded of, how Vishnu did this to you. So, so what happens next? If we do a historical analysis, um, if we look at who was present on the Asura side, who was in the Asura army in the eighth canto, we find that the leader was Bali, Bali Maharaj, and um, who's, of course, the grandson of Prahlad Maharaj. And Bali is also a natural devotee like his grandfather. And there's others like uh, the great general of the Asuras is uh, Vipra Chitti, who will take birth on earth as Jarasandha. And uh, Kalanemi, who will take birth as Kangsa. So at this point, if you study the Bhagavatam and the Mahabharata, it's clear that the Asuras split because they have two different strategies. Uh, one group, of course, is led by Bali. He wants to just take the battle to Indra again. And of course, Bali conquers Indra Loka and then the Krishna comes as Vamana. And you all know that story what happened. So, but there's another group of Asuras who are not attached to Vishnu, they hate Vishnu. And they decide to invade a sort of a small planet that where no one will suspect them and take over that planet and use it as a sort of a death star, if you know Star Wars, use that planet as a, um, a base to again take over the universe. So the planet they pick is the Earth. And there's a, there's a few reasons why they pick the Earth. Uh, one is that um, the Earth is doing very well. It's an attractive planet. It has a lot of riches. The reason is, and this gets back to another avatar of Krishna, uh, the avatar of Parashuram, because the Earth, the Earth which is invaded by the Asuras, prompting the appearance of Krishna, the Earth is in the almost immediate aftermath, not immediate, but soon after Parashuram. Parashu in Sanskrit means an ax, and Parashuram means sort of like ax pleasure. It's, um, you know, one who takes pleasure in his chopper, his ax. And so the idea is that Parashuram killed all the Kshatriyas because they were uh, fighting against the Brahmins, oppressing the Brahmins. And so then you had all these Kshatriyas, the, these warrior ladies, royal women, who have no one to marry. And so just as when the Brahmins killed Vena, it, it led to anarchy. So in the same way, there was a need to reestablish government, and government meant the royal order. So in order to reestablish a governing order on earth, uh, the most, it was decided that the Kshatriya ladies who were of marriage age and reproductive age, they approached the most pure sages, Brahmins, and asked them you know, to give these ladies a son. And that's what happened. The result of that is, that in the aftermath of Lord Parashuram, you have a royal class, a governing class on earth, who are very brahminical because their fathers are all exalted Brahmins. And the result of that, as the Mahabharata clearly states, is that um, the earth act, sort of returns to Satya Yuga, even though it's Dwapara Yuga, but the conditions on earth become just like those of Satya Yuga. And you can see this, for example, the Kuru king at that time was Pratipa, who is the father of Shantanu. Anyway, Pratipa, what is he doing? Is he 
were riding around on a chariot or a horse, uh, suppressing criminals and fighting against demons. No, he's sitting on the bank of the Ganges meditating. Why? There's nothing else to do. There are no criminals. There are no problems. Everyone's happy. Everyone's virtuous. So he's just has a lot of quality time for his yoga, spiritual yoga practice. So that's Pratipa. And then there's another uh, powerful prince named Vasu in the Chedi kingdom. If you know the map of India, Chedi is just around Jansi and below Jansi, where Prabhupada established the League of Devotees directly south of Delhi, uh, a few hundred miles. So he's also meditating and he's practicing yoga. Anyway, so what happens with this Vasu? how he Indra convinces him to again take up his royal duties rather than trying to become the next Indra. And he has a daughter named Satyavati who has a son named Vyasadeva. And so as the earth is being invaded, another point about the invasion of the earth by these Asuras is that they understand that there is a force in the universe called Dharma. And uh, this was sort of depicted in Star Wars. They called it the force, but it's actually, this goes back to the force of Dharma. And so the, the Mahabharata and other scriptures say that when, Dhar when Dharma is protected, it protects. When it is injured, it injures. In other words, if you, whatever you do to Dharma, if you attack Dharma, Dharma will attack you. So it's a force in the universe. <clears throat> and, the, and the Asuras realizing this, decide that the easiest way to take over the earth without triggering any dharmic reactions is just use our power to take birth in royal families. Because if you take birth in a royal family, you just become the leader of a country without firing a single arrow. Now, perhaps the most amazing instance of this is that when, when Indra comes down to Vasu and convinces him, really sort of points him as the protector of the earth. And at that point, he's from Chedi, not Kuru, but he was the emperor. The Mahabharata says that for at least his generation, maybe the generation afterwards, the Chedi king, actually, not the Kuru king, was the emperor. So here you have a family, a royal family, who are assigned to protect the earth and the Asuras. So what do the Asuras do? The most powerful Asura, Jarasandha, takes birth as the heir to that throne. So the Asuras actually take over, take over the, the royal family that was supposed to protect Earth from the Asuras, and they take it over. So that's the significance of Jarasandha, who of course moved his own capital to uh, Magadha, which is present day Bihar northeast of Shady. So this is a situation. Now, we also hear that Bhumi went to, earth, to Brahma and begged for help because the earth had become overrun, was being akranta, the word used in the Bhagavatam, literally means trampled, trampled by these asuras disguised as kings. And, and, and it's uh, uh, Raja Vyaja. Vyaja, they're disguised as kings in the sense that they're not really human beings. They're actually asuras from other planets and they've taken birth as humans, but they actually still have their asura powers. So it's just like a costume. They have a human costume. And so when does Bhumi actually go to Brahma? Because we have all these generations in the Mahabharata and the Bhagavatam, all these generations of this ongoing struggle. So at what point does Bhumi actually go to Ramha? It seems to me that the logical time would be uh, when Vichitravirya dies. Because you have the Chedis as a very powerful realm. And King Vasu is empowered actually by Indra to protect the earth from the Asuras. And then uh, we see power with the birth of Shantanu. Pratipa is a yogi. Uh, he's the king of the Kurus, but with the birth of his son Shantanu, uh, the Bhagavatam states, he reasserts 
the central power of the Kurus. So with Shantanu, the Kurus emerge again as a leading royal family and um, And at this point, the Asuras can't really do anything because Vasu was too strong. And then after Vasu, his son Brihadratha, who moves to Magadha uh, and gives, and, and his son, his son is Jarasandha, Brahma uh, Brihadratha is not really, it doesn't really seem that he's on board. He's not really in the mission. I mean, he rules his kingdom, but he's not, he's not like his father. He's not protecting the earth. And then, and then it goes even further down with Brihadratha's son, who's Jarasandha, who's actually the leader of the Asuras. But as long as Vasu is there, and then after Vasu, power moves to back up north to the Kuru realm. And so as long as Shantanu's, Shantanu's there, uh, the Asuras cannot make their move. They cannot really openly try to take over the planet. Uh, and also because Shantanu has a son, Bhishma, who nobody wants to mess with. So then what happens, uh, of course, Bhishma has made his vow that he uh, will never be king. And Shantanu and Satyavati have two sons, Chitrangada and Vichitravirya. But then tragically, both these sons die when they're very young. I mean, they're very young men. Chitrangada is challenged by Gandharva, who these sort of these dangerous people who are like humans, but not exactly humans, and sometimes get into rivalries with humans. So there's a Gandharva named Chitrangada, same name. So he tells the Kuru king, you've got to change your name, buddy. And of course, I mean, this is ridiculous thing to say to a Kuru kings, so they fight. And the battle goes on, I think, for years. And finally, the Gandharva kills the Kuru king, which is an absolute tragedy. And suddenly, Vichitravirya, who there's no indication he ever really wanted to be king, uh, he's kind of like make love, not war, in the sense that he, he gets married to those princesses from Kashi and actually dies because he had a, he couldn't, as I put it, he had an overtime honeymoon. He just, he'd been a very strict, it's even described, Pandu says this, because his legal son is Pandu, and Pandu at one point in Mahabharata says that my father was a completely devoted to Dharma as a, as, a, as a boy, as a young man, but when he got married, he became devoted to love or, you know, to intimacy with women, with his beautiful princesses. So suddenly, there's no Kuru heir, and this is an absolute disaster. It's an absolute uh, crisis. Because again, it's the Kurus who are protecting the earth. It's the Kurus who have taken over for King Vasu as the defenders against these Asuras. Now suddenly there's no Kuru king, and uh, Bhishma can't fight because obviously part of his vow was that he would not uh, engage in military action unless he did so at the request of or in the service of a Kuru king. Otherwise, uh, the vow that Sajivati's father got out of Bhishma would be uh, meaningless. Bhishma, let's say, could just go to another kingdom, sign up, okay, I'll be your general and I'll conquer the Kurus. And so Satyavati's father, he, he knew that his daughter will never really be safe or, or, or her children will never really be safe uh, unless Bhishma cannot take up military action except in the service of a reigning Kuru monarch. And that's the situation. So once, so, so it's a crisis because Bhishma can't fight. There's no Kuru king. There's no way to get a Kuru king. Bhishma can't fight. And there are natural enemies because at this point, remember that um, uh, there's someone who is just waiting for the Kurus to become weak. 
And that person, of course, is Jarasandha. So Jarasandha is Viprachiti. He's the great demon who is really, really the most, uh, the most powerful demon who signs up to come to earth and take over earth. And he's watching this. And um, he's the same generation, actually, as um, Vichitravirya and Chitrangada. So in the Kuru kings, so he's watching the Kurus. Because as long as there's a Kuru king and Bhisma is there to fight for them, Jarasandha is not going to really attack. But suddenly there's no Kuru king, Bhisma can't fight, and Jarasandha obviously is going to make his move. In terms of building up his army, because before that, even if he started to build up a big army, the Kurus could have just told him, don't do that. And so Jarasandha is going to build up his army. There's another natural enemy of the Kurus that's going to take advantage of this situation. And that is a you know, somewhat powerful king who, whom the Kuru leader, Bhishma, completely humiliated and disgraced. And that is Shalva who was supposed to marry Umba, and then Bhishma came in, just took her away, uh, Shalva attacked, and Bhishma humiliated him. So for, for these Kshatriyas, we're very proud to be publicly humiliated and just easily defeated in the presence of all the other, you know, his fraternity brothers. You know, all, all the other kings was just an unbearable disgrace. And so when the Kuru kings die, and Bhishma cannot fight, Shalva obviously is going to become extremely interested in joining any kind of anti-Kuru coalition. Plus you have other Asura kings around the world who have come to earth specifically to take it over in, in this Asura, Asura coalition. And so you have all these people who have a powerful interest in exploiting this Kuru weakness. In fact, the Mahabharata says at this time that um, other kings were stealing Kuru lands. They were just like, you know, they would, no one wanted to attack Hastinapur. That was still not really possible. But they were starting to pick off different Kuru lands. They were attacking other innocent kings who were Kuru allies. Situation was very bad. And what's interesting is uh, the person who actually saves the Kurus, in that sense, saves the earth, is not Bhishma. It's Satyavati. Bhishma, when Satyavati, Satyavati is almost like the only one who's really thinking clearly that this is a world crisis. We have to, we need a Kuru heir. And of course, she approaches Bhishma, and, and that's young Bhishma. And all he can really think about is my vow. I took a vow. So even if the earth is destroyed, not my problem. Which you could say is, really? I mean, seriously? But that's Bhishma at that age. He'll change later. And Bhishma goes through all these transformations. But, but Satyavati is determined to save the dynasty that she married into. She's from Shady. She's actually the daughter of, of King Vasu, who was sent away to protect her uh, when she was a little girl. She grew up with a fisherman, the fishing community, but she's the daughter of Vasu. She is very much a queen by birth, princess by birth. And so when Bhishma just says, I can't help, you know, even if the world is destroyed, sorry which later Krishna will tell Bhishma is not really the best moral philosophy. But anyway, so it's Satyavati who really says this cannot be. And so she goes to Bhishma. He says, well, I'm not going to do it. But, you know, according to Dharma, a Brahmin can give a child to these widows, Ambika and Ambalika, the widows of Vichitravari. And, of course, we have precedent because that's exactly how the entire royal order was restored after Parshuram killed all the kings. So that's basically what Bhishma says. We have historical precedent. There's another way to restore a royal dynasty. And when he says that, Satyavati says, all right, because actually the greatest Brahman on earth 
happens to be my son. And then she reveals for the first time that she had a, a son before she married Bhishma's father. Anyway, so then, uh, you know the story, Dhritarashtra is born, and Pandu, then Vidura. And with that, Bhishma can act again, because now there's a ruling. And so at that point, uh, this the Asuras have to retreat. So you can see it's going back and forth. The Asuras have to retreat, because Bhishma is the son of Ganga, and Shantanu, and again, they just people, no one wants to really get into a serious fight with Bhishma. And so, uh, and then Pandu, of course, quickly grows up, and he turns out to be, Pandu turns out to be a, uh, an incredible warrior that nobody wants to fight with. I mean, just one example, if you remember in all these Swayamvaras, these uh, wedding competitions, get beautiful princesses, that even if you win the Swayamvara, you have to fight your way out of it. I mean, even Christian. So that's just typically, you know, you can you have to fight your way out. But when, when Pandu goes down to the uh, Swayamvara of Kunti, south in, in the south, not deep south of India, but to the south in um, King Kunti Boja's kingdom, I think it was Videha, um, he wins Draupadi and just walks out. And everybody's just saying, congratulations, Pandu. Mm -hmm. So, yes, yeah, so Pandu was a, was a super tough guy. And um, so when he, when he actually takes over, he just, he just goes out with a big army and just puts the fear of God back in everyone. And so he, he takes back all the Kuru lands. He starts smashing the bad guys. And so the Asura at this point, Jarasanda, uh, kind of steps back. So the Asuras are, have to step back again. But then we know what happens, that Pandu is cursed, and then Duryodhana usurps the throne. And now the Asuras, having already taken over the, the, the Chedi and Magadha uh, kingdoms, the Asuras are now taking over the Kuru realm. And that's the last line of defense, the Kurus. And Kangsa, another Asura, has taken over the Yadus. And it's described in the Bhagavatam that all the Yadus have to flee. They go to, some of them go to Panchala, some of them go to the Kuru lands because Dhritarashtra is still there. Dhritarashtra is not one of the heaviest. He's not an Asura, but he's an enabler. He enables his Asura son. But still, the Kuru lands are a lot safer than the kingdom of Kansa. So the Yadus just start fleeing all over the country to all these different kingdoms. And the Asuras start to grow again. Yadu, uh, Jarasandha is building up his forces, Kansa. And if you look at a map, you can see between Jarasandha, uh, Dantavakra, Shishupala, um, Kansa, it actually is an alliance. It's a geographic alliance. It's just like in World War II, you have Germany and Italy. And if you look at the map, they're actually, you know, so, so there was a geographic strategy here too, a geopolitical thing. Anyway, so uh, actually I went ahead of myself too much. Let, let's go back before, before Duryodhana, uh, before, when, when Pandu is, um, so I think just to, just to put this back in perspective, I kind of got ahead of myself. So in my view, Bhumi would have gone to Brahma, who then went to Vishnu, when uh, Vichitravirya died, because at that point, the earth was actually helpless. And so um, then Krishna, of course, tells the demigods and Bhumi that he tells demigods, uh, Yadushu Pajanyatam, that you should take birth through your, you should expansions in the Jadu dynasty. And he said, then your wives also can go. So, so when Krishna takes birth, when Krishna takes birth, it's in the middle of this battle between this, it's, it's an intergalactic war. It's, it's going on in different planets. This battle between the Suras and the Asuras, it starts in the Eighth Canto on other planets, and then it spills over into the earth. And there's 
posturing in the sense of the surahs are taking birth in different kingdoms, taking over kingdoms. The, uh, the godly people are fighting back. And at a time when it's actually going well for the uh, surahs because they, you know, Kangsa has taken over the Yaru kingdom. Uh, Jarasandha is more powerful than ever. You people like Shishupala, uh, of course, he comes a little later. But there's all kinds of Asuras taking power, and the Asuras are actually winning. The Asuras are actually winning, and they're gradually taking over the earth just by birth. They're taking over the earth, and it's in that situation that Krishna comes. That's the situation. It's a great cosmic battle that's been going on for centuries in different planets, and then Krishna comes. And when he comes, precisely because he comes at a time when the Asuras is so powerful, Kongsu tries to kill him. And um, so that's the birth of Krishna. The birth of Krishna takes place within this historical context, which he himself orchestrated. When Krishna comes to this world, he, Krishna, uh, he cre as Kunti says, he creates this whole dramatic historical situation. And so I've, I've given you a very brief summary, and there's a, there are many, many more interesting details about what was going on on the earth, what, what the political and military alliances were, who the friends were, who the enemies were. It's something which I'm working on now in Law of Art, but it was a, a very complex and long-standing historical situation, and then Krishna came, and, and then everything started to change. So uh, I'll stop there. Uh, thank you all for listening. Just look very quickly to see if there are any questions here. Um, no, so thank you all very much. And happy Janmashtami. And for tomorrow, I'll, I'll be speaking again at 11 o'clock. West Coast time, San Diego, uh, tomorrow at 11 o'clock on the occasion of Prabhupada's Puja Day. So thank you. Hare Krishna.